Hello, everyone. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Democracy in the Age of Cryptography. I'd like to welcome Stephen to the stage to introduce our next speaker. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening or morning or wherever this may be right now for you. Um, today, I'm going to be moderating the session with Santiago Siri uh, for his discussion on democracy in the age of crypto. And I will allow Santiago to take over whenever he may. And then uh, after his uh, lecture has finished, um, I'll be taking questions from the audience, also having questions myself, and we'll have a you know kind of an open air discussion. So Santiago, whenever you're ready, you can begin whenever you feel comfortable. Good. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen here uh, when I can find the right window to do it. Uh, share screen. Um, there we go. So um, I work for an organization called Democracy Earth. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is um, researching what, what democracy is in the age of information. Uh, throughout the last five years, we have implemented all sorts of pilots with political parties, with government, with uh, nonprofit organizations and blockchain based networks. And we have um, also implemented in those pilots all the different variants we can think of in democracy. We have done uh, pilots based on the idea of liquid democracy. Um, we have done participatory budgeting, direct voting. Um, and of course, one of the most interesting outcomes uh, is uh, quadratic voting itself. Um, long story short about our experience doing democratic systems is that we always try to work with constituencies that have to face a real decision, uh, a, a high stakes decision. We don't like doing or implementing pilots just to make a survey. So we were lucky to find some of these contexts in the last five years. And the thing about democracy is that uh, these are systems that need to make decisions in very hostile environments. The higher the stakes, the higher the need for legitimacy. And uh, this also means that there will be uh, participants in the electoral process that will have the incentives to try to corrupt the system. So in our last five years, we have seen also all kinds of attacks uh, to the democratic uh, systems that we have put in place. In those uh, pilots, through those pilots, one of our, the most interesting experiences for us was the implementation of quadratic voting. Quadratic voting, uh, it has been already pr pretty much covered by the conference by Radical Exchange, since it's an idea that comes from this movement. Uh, but it, it's, it has the benefit of allowing the voter, of giving the voter the possibility of not only signaling his or her preference, but also uh, the intensity of those preferences. Uh, just to make a quick overview on how quadratic voting does this is very simple. These are, here are three steps. Um, let's say you, are, uh, you have 10 tokens, the voter has 10 tokens. If you put one vote on one issue, it will cost one token. If you put two votes on one issue, it will cost. Uh, it will have a quadratic cost, so it will cost four tokens instead of two tokens. If you put three votes, then it will cost you almost all of your tokens. Um, there are many properties of why quadratic voting makes sense. Here's a, a, a slide with a lot of uh, words uh, that you can take a screenshot of. But uh, among those properties, we find that. Um, Ultimately, when you think about elections, uh, every election around the world is a decision where you have the weak preferences of the majority uh, fighting or competing against the strong preferences of the minorities. Every election at the end of the day, uh, it's decided between those two, uh, those two realms and quadratic voting uh, has this particular benefit of being able to capture uh, the strength of these identities. Um, we have seen throughout several uh, 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 tests and, 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 and pilots that have been done with quadratic voting interesting properties. 
it makes sedentary more expensive. Uh, quadratic voting pushes the voter to really find a common ground. Either you will go all in on the one idea that you want to support us as a minority, or you might go uh, with a subtle approach to different, uh, to different ideas that you might want to support. Um, and uh, it, it helps to mitigate the tyranny of the majority, assuming everybody cares the same amount uh, to capture the plight of minorities and issues that dra dramatically affect certain groups of people. Um, with QV, you can vote uh, harder on what's closer to home. So here's an example of also another uh, pilot that how, this was not done with us, but it was a pilot uh, implementing Likert scale ballots. These are the typical ballots where you strongly disagree and you strongly agree at some points in the middle. And this, were, uh, was, this was a test done with 10,000, almost 10,000 voters. Uh, and the results, it's really interesting when you compare uh, an electoral process without quadratic voting with quadratic voting. Without quadratic voting, uh, you tend to see people voting more closer to the extremes. Uh, either they, you know, here's an example on Obamacare, where it's a very polarizing choice, where usually in a traditional voting model, you have more people either uh, strongly disagreeing or strongly agreeing, where with quadratic voting, uh, people tend to go closer to the middle, finding a common ground. Uh, here's another example for uh, paying women equally. Uh, and uh, again, the, the, the polarizing or the strong positions tend to find more common ground in the, in the nuanced middle points. Um, in 2019, uh, last year, uh, right after the, the, the last, uh, last year's radical exchange movement in Detroit, we uh, did the first implementation of quadratic voting by a government of the United States. We implemented QV for the state of Colorado. Uh, and this was a very interesting pilot because it was done with the Democrat caucus. It's 41 legislators working uh, uh, for the Colorado House, uh, or the Colorado Congress. And these 41 legislators had to decide how to prioritize uh, 107 uh, uh, legislative projects, 107 bills that they were aiming to introduce in Congress for the next two years. And um, the interesting thing is that the year before, in 2018, they tried to do a model of participatory budgeting where they gave to each legislator 15 tokens and they simply allocated the tokens to the bills. And under a linear uh, participatory budgeting model, they ended up with a big blob where 60 to 70% of the bills had the same amount of votes. Um, Last year, we implemented quadratic voting instead, where the model that we used was giving legislators, each one of them, 100 tokens, and they had to allocate these tokens uh, into the bills. Uh, probably uh, the average legislator were able to vote for five or six bills. Um, and when we look at the distribution of how uh, the, the distribution of votes ended up in the end result, we had a very organic distribution that allowed the legislators not only to detect which are the most uh, uh, preferred bills, but really be able to develop a long tail of preferences across all of the 107 bills. No more than four or five bills have the same amount of votes under the quadratic voting model. And this was highlighted by, by Representative Hansen, who led this effort with the, the, the Democrat House, um, where he said you know, the process last year generated a big blob of bills with roughly the same number of votes and no clear preferences. Whereas with quadratic voting, uh, 107 bills that were competing for a budget of $180 million were able to be prioritized. Um, when you look into the specifics, uh, it's really interesting. The number one bill was uh, about equal pay. Uh, which makes sense coming from the Democrat Party. And uh, of the top 10 bills, uh, five of them were related to healthcare issues, uh, which is also really interesting with how to get uh, the Democrat Party gather more insight about how, uh, about their, 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 their uh, priorities. 
Um, there's uh, some nice articles in the media if you want to look in about this in more detail. There's a Wired article, uh, uh, Colorado tried a new way to vote, make people pay quadratically. Um, there's a, the Colorado Sun also covered this, this, uh, this experience. And, and my favorite article is the one from Bloomberg, a new way of voting that makes CELA3 expensive. Uh, well, here's a nice quote, quadratic voting is the one pricing rule under which voters who intend only their own gain are led as if by an invisible hand to advance the interests of society. Um, there's a quote that I read recently on Twitter by someone on the conference that said, the nice thing about quadratic voting is that everyone is happy about uh, how they voted. Um, so, um, let's go to the blockchain now. Uh, what's going on in terms of governance with the blockchain? And um, even though this is, at least my personal opinion, is that it's the most exciting field for governance uh, in the world right now because it's you know cutting edge technology and it's driving um, economic interests beyond the control of uh, traditional jurisdictions or nation states has tremendous potential. We have to admit that today, all of blockchain governance from Bitcoin to every single smart contract that is working on chain on Ethereum is pretty much plutocratic. Uh, folks out there are voting with their tokens, are voting with their share of the, of the network. And usually this means that those who have a larger share will have a larger voice. And uh, this might be okay for some projects, but can be conflicting when it's about uh, public goods uh, and you have to deal with uh, conflicting interests. Um, a, a brief overview on why it's like this way, you know, if we look into the original paper of uh, Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto specifically mentions that proof of work, the consensus algorithm of Bitcoin is essentially one CPU, one vote. So whoever has more CPUs for computing capacity will have more votes in the system. Um, whereas, uh, uh, for example, in the case of proof of stake, which is the alternative uh, to proof of work that consists on the validators being able to decide or verify transactions based on their stake of their network from the assets they hold on the network, we, we also see this, this situation. There was an interesting vote on Aragon, which is a, a, a network for distributed autonomous organizations for DAOs uh, where um, they had a recent vote where you can see on each column here, uh, each one of the tokens of the addresses voting with their tokens. And initially, you know, you see small amounts of votes for yes or no on whether to assign uh, a, a given amount of tokens to a grant. And at the end, at the very end of the vote, a huge whale comes in and puts all of the all of their tokens uh, to tumble the election based on their own specific interests. So whales can do this. Uh, you just see how the election goes for the small voters, and you wait till the last minute and you tumble the election with your own tokens in the way you want the outcome to happen, which renders the interests of all the other voters completely irrelevant. And uh, the only real decision maker uh, having an influence on this process is the whale holding large amount of tokens. Um, so why can't we have uh, democratic systems on the blockchain uh, yet? And uh, the reason is that, that we still haven't figured out how to do uh, identity in a decentralized way. Um, there's a nice quote from Ed Snowden uh, given last year in Web3 Berlin, where he said the one vulnerability being exploited across all systems is identity. Um, if we look at American democracy right now, if we look at Mark Zuckerberg testifying in Congress uh, as a, you know, giving, trying to find answers to what, what happened with Cambridge Analytica, uh, it's basically because Facebook is the largest repository of identity in the world. And that has made Facebook one of the strongest uh, campaign uh, tools in the world that it's uh, being able because it tracks our daily activity either through Instagram, WhatsApp, or any of the Facebook properties out there. Uh, it has made it has turned Facebook into a tool that can hijack democracies anywhere uh, through 
uh, manipulation uh, during campaigns. This has been the case not only in 2016, but also probably in 2012 and 2008, when a co-founder of Facebook led the social media strategy for Barack Obama. The influence of large repositories of identities like Facebook uh, is enormous in democratic processes anywhere in the world. So with a group of researchers in the blockchain space, uh, which we're trying to figure out, you know, can, can we do a system that does uh, rather than proof of work or proof of stake, uh, a sort of proof of personhood? And, and what would proof of personhood look like and how it could be, with what technologies could this be implemented? Um, if we were able to do, a proof of personhood or proof of humanity, however you want to call it. Um, then uh, if we were to solve this, which is a huge if, uh, we would be able to build social applications on the blockchain. We will be able to build democracies, uh, universal basic income, uh, reputation systems uh, that can be attached to credit, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of new interesting ideas addressing society uh, would be happening. Um, so to achieve this, we have to face very, very strong uh, constraints, very strong challenges. Um, so we don't recreate all over again Facebook or uh, the Chinese Communist Party, another large index of human identities. Um, for instance, uh, if we have humans validating other humans, we have to be aware that the rise of artificial intelligence uh, is creating uh, systems of uh, delusion that can really um, confuse us. Uh, for instance, all of the faces you see here on this slide, none of these humans exist. None of them are actually real. These are all faces generated by an, a neural network that learns the different traits of the human face and is able to create new faces based on those learnings. Uh, and this technology is simply going to get better and better over the next years, uh, well, we'll probably be able to see systems like this, being able to fake voices, being able to fake faces not only as a photograph, but also as a video. So we humans might be uh, targeted and confused uh, by, by these types of systems if we have to be the validators of identities. Um, we could also work with reputation, the, the, the concept of a web of trust where someone vouches for someone else. It's a common concept that has been tried and used uh, many times over to do decentralized identity. But at the end of the day, with what, what happens with that is that you will have people with more reputation than others, and you will get uh, a centralization, a new kind of centralization through other means under a system like this that implemented, implemented a reputation algorithm like PageRank, which is the one I used to illustrate this slide. And, and also another fact to consider is that if you think about identity as a pointer in a, a one dimensional pointer in a database, where that pointer is, that point is um, a username or a phone address or an email, that property alone of uh, describing identity as a point in a database where that consists of an index of identities, that property alone enables surveillance as we know it. So uh, phone numbers, username, email address, uh, however you want to describe the, the index of uh, an identity, um, we have to be aware that if that information gets leaked, it can be exploited in, in several ways and can be used for surveillance. So uh, going back to Edward Snowden, uh, which by the way, I'm reading his uh, biography right now, and he turns out to be a very good writer. And it's a very enjoyable book. And for anyone born in the early 90s, 80s, uh, um, living with computers, will feel related to his, to his youth. Um, on Web3 in Berlin, he said something that uh, how we should address the problem of identity, he said, we have to verify the right to use a technology, not the identity itself. We have to create systems where uh, we have to think about them more in terms of access and rights and, and avoid uh, getting the user having to describe uh, or getting to disclose personal information about her uh, in any possible way. 
So um, there are some interesting ideas out there. I'm, I'm a big fan of obviously of, of Glenn Wild's work and he co-authored co this paper on intersectional identity, uh, which basically means uh, on a pre-formal uh, situation, we usually identify ourselves by the intersection of social groups we belong to. When we first meet someone, we probably uh, connect the dots about that someone based on what groups that person belongs to. And we start building the identity of that person based on those groups. So looking at social intersections is an interesting way to start creating identity in a way that, it's, uh, uh, that can lead to a healthy decentralized context. I, I highly recommend this paper. Uh, if it's available online, you can probably find it with a, with a Google search. So there are some prototypes addressing this problem out there. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick overview of them. Um, one uh, of the interesting ongoing experiments is uh, Kleros is doing uh, a web of trust, uh, basically using the token curated registry system that Kleros implemented. Uh, this consists of folks submitting video proofs and other folks in the web of trust vouching for those for those folks. Again, this has the issue of having to disclose information about yourself, which is uh, can be can be a bit challenging. You're disclosing a bit of your identity, but it's aiming to go for the web of trust route. An interesting thing about Kleros is that it has this system of jurors, uh, which is uh, a, and uses some sortition elements in order to assign those jurors to judge the participants in the in the registry. Um, it's an ongoing development, and I'm looking forward to, to see how this evolves. Um, a particular uh, original approach and very, uh, very, very interesting is the one led by a Russian effort called IDENA. Uh, IDENA does uh, synchronous Turing tests. Uh, these are Turing tests that are AI resistant, meaning that they cannot be brute forceable by a computer or by a neural network. And it's, it, these are problems that are easy for humans, but very hard for machines. And um, for example, these Turing tests consist of these strips where you have uh, four images and in one of the strips, the images make sense, have a story to tell. Uh, and in the other strip, the story is simply not there because computers do not have the cultural background we might have as humans computers are not simply are not able to decode the information happening here. Whereas a human can look at the, at the flowers, at the cat and the, the broken flowers, and then the mopping the floor and can you know, take a guess that that might be the right uh, strip. And um, what IDENA does is every, every week or so, uh, they reveal this test in simultaneous, synchronously, so uh, human participants start solving this. Computers don't have yet the information how to solve this. And because it's a synchronous event, uh, unless there is some kind of Einstein out there that might be able to solve a lot of this super fast, uh, because it's a synchronous event, it prevents Sibyls from uh, being generated in the system. Uh, IDENA calls this uh, as a proof of personhood, which I like a lot. It's, more nuance around the attention that they're able to capture on the network, rather than specifically talking about uh, signaling a human on itself. Um, then there are projects that use uh, graph analysis and social connections. Uh, Bright ID is one of these projects um, that uh, takes approach similar to intersectional identity um, by looking at uh, by looking at uh, our you know the trusted groups uh, with that, uh, and through the, the, social in, uh, the social relations of these trusted groups and intersection of these relations uh, to create an index of trusted identities. Um, then there are uh, ideas around hardware, anonymous tracking devices. But again, uh, this is, these are not, uh, we will try to stick with stuff that is being done on, on the software uh, side of things. So, um, at Democracy Earth, we've been thinking you know, hard about this problem. And uh, one of the directions we, we've been researching is thinking about identity as a probability, thinking about probabilistic identity, and trying to 
find ways of detecting the probability of an, an address in the blockchain belonging to a unique human rather than uh, uh, specifically trying to address who or uh, that human is or if it's a human or not in a discrete way. So thinking of humanity more as a spectrum and not a discrete value. Uh, we have written a paper that we published in February this, this year. It's, uh, it brings a lot of these ideas together. It's called Intersubjective Consensus. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to describe a quick overview of what we're thinking about it here, but brought uh, a lot of the ideas I just shared together in order to, to address this problem. Um, identity is hard because at the end of the day, it's a combination of two functions. Uh, an objective function uh, and a subjective function. Uh, the objective function can be a score, can be something that is, uh, you know, something that we can all agree on how that score works, uh, whether it's, you know, the code inside your DNA or your age or your uh, fingerprint, but it's an objective measurement. But at the same time, uh, we require something that tells us on how to agree about that objective measurement. Uh, because if someone comes and says that certain DNA code is not okay, uh, then we have a political problem uh, with that statement. So uh, the objective score needs a subjective mechanism of governance that keeps uh, the objective score uh, uh, legitimate for the vast majority of the participants in the network. So we cannot escape the problem of governance because ultimately uh, someone needs to watch the watchman when it comes about as allocating or assigning identities. Um, so an idea that we're exploring as an objective metric uh, is we can look at something that it's already happening in the blockchain space uh, and that has some kind of human entropy in them. And these are DAOs. DAOs are distributed autonomous organizations. Uh, these are organizations that are created to make collective decisions in the blockchain. These are decisions that cannot be automated away uh, because you know, these are probably financial or economic decisions or political decisions uh, that cannot be uh, trusted to bots require human governance because they are, DAOs are pooling funds for more than, than one human. So uh, DAOs at the end of the day are social groups, are creating the social graph on chain. And something that we can look as an objective metric that can help us create a proxy to detect unique humans is uh, trying to see if this, uh, the Gini coefficient of DAOs, the Gini coefficient uh, is a me measurement that uh, uh, is able to tell how egalitarian a society is. If you have a genie uh, close to zero, uh, it, it, you are probably very egalitarian. If you have a genie close to one, you are a very uh, inegalitarian society. There's a lot of inequalities if you're close to one. Uh, so we can apply this measurement to DAOs and we can look at the addresses participating in a DAO and the shares that each address has. And if a DAO is relatively uh, egalitarian in the distribution of shares, uh, then we can assume that the addresses participating in that DAO uh, might belong to a unique human, where in, rather than being a DAO where there's uh, a lot of inequality and maybe one person or a few, pers few people have a lot of the shares. Um, so the, as an objective metric, we're looking into the Gini coefficient of DAOs, which will also give us an interesting metric of DAOs as a whole. Um, and as a, a subjective means of governance, then uh, of course I could always create a DAO that, has, uh, that gives one share to every new address. And, but at the same time, every of the new addresses, uh, I can create all of these addresses myself. And that would be a Gini perfect DAO, and a perfectly egalitarian DAO even though I have civil attack and created all of the addresses of that DAO. So we need this subjective governance aspect to, for identity. And this subjective governance aspect for identity, uh, we are exploring the idea of doing a DAO that ranks the trustworthiness of all of the DAOs in the ecosystem. And we can do it with quadratic voting 
because quadratic voting is very good at ranking a long tail of preferences, as we have shown in our Colorado pilot. So um, we actually did a Gitcoin bounty for this during the Radical Exchange Gitcoin hackathon uh, that happened a few weeks before this event. Uh, we had eight uh, participants competing for this bounty. Uh, and we had actually two winners to create a quadratic voting DAO. Uh, the, uh, the winner actually is uh, uh, Wildcards uh, World, which is a startup that is uh, trying to help, uh, 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 trying to, to protect animals and, 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 and species that are endangered species. And they have created a quadratic voting DAO with interesting me game mechanics. I encourage you to check out our bounty, check out the submissions. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is an instrument that we'll be implementing moving forward with our, with our model. And um, hopefully this will help us create a probabilistic personhood score uh, where we combine the objective measurement of uh, the genies of the DAOs with the, with the quadratic voting ranking of the DAO itself. And it can give us a score of how likely any given address in the blockchain that is participating in DAOs we also want to incentivize participation in DAOs. Uh, my, my, uh, the, the chances of that address being a unique human. Um, we are also exploring ways of extending this measurement to every address on chain. Uh, so we could create something that can uh, be deployed as a network uh, and help answer the question of who watches the watchman. Uh, the next step in our process is to uh, once, once we're about to release a version of our software that is tracking all of the DAOs uh, operating in Ethereum right now, we will actually launch this on democracy.earth. So we want to turn democracy.earth into a DAO browser itself. And the next step, once we have our proof of personhood score or early first version of an oracle for this, which we're very close to, to actually uh, release right now, uh, we'll, then we'll do a, a universal basic income activation through our token, which is a token based on uh, on time. So every address that has a, let's say, a proof of person who score above 33% will be able to mint uh, by, with the elapsed time, since you become a valid identity. As time goes by, you will be able to mint these tokens. And uh, we, want to, we want to make a token that is able to signal on, on Ethereum uh, a, a minimum wage, a universal minimum wage based on, on hours, on hourly, hourly time. Uh, so we have the, the ERC token is already out there, but uh, now we're connecting the systems together. Uh, to sum up, we, uh, the end game of the network that we want to create is uh, aiming for a network that is able to signal equality, uh, meaning that no single person uh, in the real world should be able to demonstrate they have a person who could score above 100, meaning that you have more, uh, you are more, more human than, than what the, this system is able to admit. Uh, we know that uh, there are, this is a very complex problem. It's a, an extremely difficult uh, a challenge to address, but uh, uh, if we want to make sure that blockchain networks don't remain strictly financial and strictly uh, driving profits and interests for uh, uh, centralized uh, and concentrated interest and that blockchain network can begin addressing society and address society in a way that they don't recreate an Orwellian nightmare like what happened with the web protocols. Uh, we need to keep on trying and keep on uh, uh, aiming to, to push forward uh, ideas in this direction so we can make sure that we can use the internet not, all, not only to, to help people around the world communicate with each other and transact with each other, but also make sure that we can use the internet to help people anywhere in the world deploy democratic systems and make uh, the world more fair and uh, empower voices, the disenfranchised voices that, are, uh, that need empowerment now more than ever. Um, you can find me on Twitter. My nickname there is Santi City. Uh, and uh, yeah, I work for Democracy Earth and I've been leading radical exchange here in Madrid as well. Go back to the to Zoom and 
hope you you like the, the presentation. I don't know if we have any questions. Yeah, we have some questions here on uh, on our end. So um, we have one from the audience from AXO who asked, what are the lessons and ideas that Santiago has right now regarding connecting citizens to the current powers that be? What are the strategies of accelerating that across the world? Hmm. So connecting with the current power, uh, my original approach to exploring democracy and, and the internet and digital technology goes back eight years ago when we started a political party called Partido de la Red or the Net Party back in Argentina. And it was a political party that was uh, a Trojan horse. Uh, we actually literally built a Trojan horse where we had candidates that were committed to voting Congress, always according to what people told them online how to vote. We went through the process of doing the party, running for Congress, getting, we got 1% of the votes, which was a lot for a young party. It's almost 22,000 votes. And then politics, uh, like real politique took over. Uh, the inside the party, you, the historical divisions of Republicans and Democrats you might see in Argentina emerged from inside the party. Uh, and uh, those that were in the party trying to do a career in politics eventually went to work with larger parties in the system, which is a similar thing to what happened to the Pirate Party, for example, in Europe, where uh, it eventually became just one of the parties of the left uh, and, and a part of a larger movement of green parties and stuff like that. So traditional politics ends up sucking up uh, you know, new uh, innovative uh, attempts to try to change the, the system. Uh, I, always, I do believe that, you know, if you try to change the system from within, the longer you stay from that system, in that system, the more likely the system will end up changing you first. I grew to be very skeptical of traditional politics. Uh, and when I went to San Francisco, I got, you know, the, the philosophy, the Buckminster Fuller's mindset of build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I tend to like that philosophy now more uh, than the Trojan horse approach. So uh, the challenge to me right now is uh, clearly with blockchain, we are creating you know, a new jurisdiction entirely based on digital means. It's an incredible, incredibly powerful force. If I look at my country, Argentina, where there's very high inflation, very corrupt institutions, the adoption of Bitcoin and Ethereum and DAI, for example, uh, is growing very, very steadily, and it provides people that have access to the internet, which is the vast majority of the population right now, with an alternative for their savings. Uh, and it's just a matter of time of teaching citizens not only how to use this for you know, store value or trading, but eventually gain the advanced usage of these networks, being able to create DAOs, being able to interact with the global economy without any interference uh, from, from the local government, there, I think you know, we have a challenge of trying to engage citizens with this new model of power uh, and learning the tools of this new model of, of uh, this new model for the economy and for the politics as a whole. Uh, rather than, uh, you know, I still work with governments, I still work, you know, we do pilots, we've done a pilot with the Colorado State House, but these are interesting contexts to try out ideas. Uh, but the real grassroots solution is if citizens as a whole adopt these new technologies. And these technologies are by definition disruptive of traditional legacy politics and, and, and legacy finance. So that, that's how I view things right now. I lost your audio, you're muted still. Oh, excuse me. So uh, in relation to decentralized identity, why is a decentralized identity important to implement in relation to like quadratic voting? Is it because we can't trace the same person across transactions? So quadratic voting works, works really well. Uh, you know, if you have real identities, uh, it's, it's, it's otherwise the effect of um, being able to, to, you know, the, the effect of being able to, to drive this, is in the, the preferences and intensities. If someone is controlling multiple identities, the whole purpose of the electoral process gets, gets broken. Um, although you, you know, we have mechanisms like quadratic funding, which can be 
uh, also uh, does require a strong identity layer where you know when you do quadratic funding uh, it does require for the calculation to do the the matching of funds uh, it's very important you know it's this difference between having if you have a lot of small donors you will have a larger share than if you have one single big donor uh, being able to measure how many donors you have is critical otherwise the whole concept of quadratic funding breaks down uh, you want to reward those uh, efforts in the community that have uh, a lot of supporters even though those supporters might not be the the deepest pockets. Um, and quadratic voting works the same way. Um, you want, you want uh, a system of governance that is really trying to address uh, the issues that are being expressed by minorities that are... The, the interesting thing about, uh, you know, if you look at liquid democracy, for example, which was an idea we tried out many years ago, uh, at the end game of the liquid democracy with the delegations of votes, or liquid democracy, you can vote directly on each other, you delegate votes to someone else. At the end of the day, the end game of that leads to uh, two super parties. You will end up having replicating all over again, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, there were some delegated proof of state protocols out there like LISC. And it is interesting to see the story of that community because they ended up with two big parties competing for the control of the network until a part of the network uh, forked off and then they created their own version. But we, we ended up learning that liquid democracy or delegated proof of stake leads to a two-party system as an end game situation all over again. With quadratic voting, uh, the thesis the, or the hypothesis is that you will end up having a lot of an end game situation where you will have a wide range of minorities competing for the votes. Uh, you as a voter either can go all in for a minority or you can spread your, your votes on, on different issues. But the, the equilibrium of the community around quadratic voting uh, is, is much more uh, likely to be a, a very good representation of different minorities uh, in the, in the, of, from the community rather than ended up with a two-party system that makes a two-party system will push you to do tactical voting. And you will you will vote for the lead, you know you won't vote for who you really want to vote you will vote for who you, who you really want will make the other side lose uh, and it's tactical voting it takes you away from your own personal interests so with quadratic voting it's critical that we address a good way to do identity when we're talking about blockchain context in traditional context we can do in a centralized authority we can do an identity in a, in a very easy way but on the blockchain space uh, identity is critical to keep these systems democratic and properly addressing the, the needs of uh, and minorities which is which, which is which what should be well represented under a quadratic voting scheme Yeah, in relation to that, um, and this is another one from a gentleman in the audience named Martin. He asked, have you thought of ways to combine liquid democracy and quadratic voting together? Yeah, we, we, we thought about that. But as I said before, uh, we fear that liquid democracy will lead to concentration of votes because it's the efficient way to, to actually play that game. Uh, if you play the game of liquid democracy, uh, it, it, uh, it pushes for a kind of politics where it's a system of delegates and uh, the delegates will earn more power. Um, actually, you know, look, going back to history, uh, it's interesting to see how the Soviets, uh, the Soviets uh, were a system of governance uh, that was uh, you know, led by the workers in theory uh, under the during the Russian Soviet Union uh, and the system of Soviet Soviets were councils of workers that make all of the decisions and the most important decision that each one of these councils made was to elect a delegate and then the, the delegate would go to Moscow and work with the other delegates and you know we know now from history that that system of governance of delegates and delegates electing other delegates leads to an oligarchy a very clear oligarchy uh, that uh, uh, very rarely changes at the top because you have all of these delegates that are 
incredibly sophisticated professionals at you know getting the consensus from the local community and then once they go to the top of the party they they rarely leave the top of the party uh, democracy has to be this system where you can change actually the top and the top has this this renewal process um, I think on the West we have the same thing. We have professional politicians, and if you look at the age of Congress right now and, and, and Washington, uh, it's the boomers in power. The age of the average politician in power keeps going up. The candidates running for Congress in the United States are all people above 75 years old, which is bizarre, considering that the vast majority of the population is probably under 40. Uh, so um, the the you know. We, we have to be aware that you know some ideas sound incredibly interesting at the beginning. We we actually at Democracy Earth we tried them all out, uh, yeah, and even with quadratic voting, we have to be very, very cautious on, on how the end game will end up looking. That's why I put the last slide on what's the end game we should strive for. And in democracy, it's an end game of equality where we all get the same share of power in the system. Uh, and equality is one big missing ingredient in, in the blockchain space still. Come on, all right. Are you still there? Yep, yeah, I'm still here. Excellent. So in regards to um, the uh, Gini coefficient that you were discussing, this comes from another question from the audience. Um, then they ask, how would a coefficient at a community level um, tell us anything about an individual's identity? I thought that's the problem we're trying to solve. Yeah, it's um, so we're using the Gini coefficient pretty much as a, a proxy measurement. We, we don't want to, we want to be able to create a system that we never really know anything about the person itself, the identity itself, uh, and pretty much in the spirit of what Snowden said, you know, just verify the right to use the technology, don't verify the identity. Uh, a system for voting uh, only needs to know that you haven't voted twice. Uh, it doesn't need to know who you are. And uh, that's, that's the critical aspect. Uh, how, how can we do some kind of, uh, zero knowledge process where, uh, you know, I know you voted, but I don't know who you are. And it's a very delicate approach. So the route of using the Gini coefficient and DAOs, of Gini, the, the Gini of DAOs, is just uh, finding a, a reliable proxy. Of course, you know, we have to also rank the trustworthiness of DAOs so the system does not get exploited. A reliable proxy to estimate the probability of another being belonging to a unique human. Now, this, this will give us a probabilistic score, which means you, know, you might be 11% human or 20% human or 90% human, according to this score. Uh, the, then the system has to come to a consensus, which is the minimum threshold for you to be acknowledged as a human. You know, it could be 5%, it could be 50%, it could be 90%. I don't know, we have to explore with that. And, um, and, uh, and from there on, you know, try to create a mechanism that can look at every address on the blockchain and based on the, how this address participates in DAOs and on which DAOs, try to draw a conclusion of whether that address might be uh, qualified as a unique human or not. Uh, it's a very different approach to identity in, in terms of, you know, show us your picture with your passport or give us your fingerprint. We are aware of that, um, but uh, you know we have to look at identity under a complete new lens in, in the digital, in cyberspace, uh, because uh, you know the risk of ending up with yet another kind of Facebook or another kind of you know, Chinese Communist Party uh, is very likely, uh, and uh, that's why uh, we try to find what attributes. Uh, an identity in the system needs to have without us requiring, you know, uh, for for uh, no knowing having to know anything about the identity itself. Excellent. Well, thank you, Santiago. I think we might be getting down to the wire here, and time is up. 
Um, but if anyone else would like to learn more about Santiago, uh, could you give us your Twitter again? Yes, it's uh, Santi City, uh, and I spent a big part of my day there chatting and trolling and discussing on crypto Twitter. So find me there. Oh, and you can also follow you at Democracy Earth as well, correct? Uh, that's right. Democracy Earth has all of the foundation's ideas. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, Santiago, and please enjoy the rest of your day.